I now hand over the reins to our governance panel, Keepers of the Heart, George Bandy and Susan Kaplan. Thank you guys so much. And uh, I'm humbled and grateful to be a part of this team with Susan Kaplan, who's a long-term friend. All the statements from the community, Mahesh, Joel, Kimberly Lewis, uh, really have resonated over the last couple of weeks since I've been meditating on this quite a bit. The pandemic and um, its impact has unveiled a lot of things and reassured some. The preciousness of life, the importance of the disparities between race, class, health and wellness and access. Uh, also in the last week, this reawakening of the moral and civil inequities that we've seen have also created a reminder of the true importance of this charge that we have in front of us. There have been lots of challenges that have been out there and they've been recognized by Kimberly but those challenges have also put some things in front of us. Uh, I've been to every green build. And since my third green build, I asked Rick and have asked Mahesh to continue to increase the value and the importance of having more diversity at green build. And they have accepted that challenge. Uh, speakers like Desmond Tutu, Bernice King, Majora Carter, Carlton Brown, Diane Dillon Ridgely, President Obama have fueled my relationship with Joel Todd and Susan Kaplan related to social equity and its importance. So I wanted to share with you guys that as much as there's been not enough activity, there have been brewings of opportunities for us to get to this point, and I'm grateful to be a part of that. So I'm looking forward to sharing and challenging and placing obstacles and uh, also reassuring uh, affirmations for those of you who will be participating, but at the same time, I ask you to step outside of your comfort zone and recognize things that you may not be viewing as social equity because of your perspective and accept those as a challenge for yourself to move forward and get stronger as we begin to move this next initiative of what I'm considering the new USGBC social equity movement. Susan? Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and to be sharing uh, this panel with George. Uh, it looks like we're the guinea pigs and we get the uh, the sexiest topic, uh, governance. I, I started looking into it. I wonder what does governance really mean anyway? Um, how do we define it? The word actually has its word in the Greek word kybernen, which means to steer or to pilot a ship. And the modern day usage seems to have arisen to some part because of the difficulty of solving what is called wicked problems, not evil, but difficult, those resistant to a clear and agreed solution. Since government alone could not solve these problems, it became more about the interactions between government, private and civic organizations and stakeholders. And I think that sets the tone well for what we're going to talk about this morning, what we need to think about to be seriously addressing these problems of inequity brought into very stark light, even more directly by the pandemic. So for the first panel, we have four presentations that will give us different perspectives on how to, how to do just that. We'll start off by hearing from Kimberly Vermeer about where USGBC has been and could go on the subject of affordable housing. We will hear from Richard Gelb and Nori Katabe, government officials in Kings County, Seattle, about a process that concentrates on inclusion and includes deep mapping to really understand issues and opportunities at a neighborhood level in order to be able to move to distribute distributional equity. Then we'll hear from Kendra Norrell, a public official in Richmond, Virginia, on how to really do community engagement to make it meaningful and lasting as part of the creation of RVA Green 2050, Richmond's Climate Action and Resilience Plan that is equity-centered. And then we'll go to the level of a design firm and hear about the values and inclusions of HKS in their mission and in their projects um, with Rand Ekman, Isabel Santos, and Sarah. I'm Sarah, I'm sorry, I'll get this name wrong, Sarah Wynett Sianazeski. And uh, on a personal note, um, I, I've been working on the social equity working group with Joel since its beginning, and I am so excited that we're now at the point of bringing together all of you to discuss how really to make it a part of USGBC's core mission and everything it touches. So without further ado, I will turn over the gavel to Kimberly Vermeer. Thank you. So, so along with being keepers of the heart, Susan and I are also keepers of time. 
and mm-hmm. know that hearts are related to love. Just know that when we say, hey, let's move along, it's only in love <laughs> trying to keep up with the time that's been allocated for us. So please be mindful. Thank you. I'm glad for the introduction and to be part of this first panel on governance. My title of my talk is Affordable Housing is Integral to USGBC's Four Pillars in USGBC 2.0 of Sustainability, Resilience, Equity, and Health. And I'm going to make the case that if USGBC is going to live into these four pillars, it needs to reinvigorate its commitment to affordable housing in its governance, in its staffing, and in its programs. USGBC has stated that uh, its four pillars are sustainability, resilience, equity, and health. And this is aligned with the goals of affordable housing. In affordable housing and community development, sustainability and resilience are fundamental to the development that advances equity by providing high quality homes and neighborhoods to low income and underserved people. In fact, uh, it can be argued that affordable housing is not equitable unless it is sustainable and resilient and healthy. And so in thinking about equity, these four values are absolutely aligned with the goals of the affordable housing world. In terms of what equity means in the affordable housing and community development sector, it means access to opportunity. And that means access to jobs, to housing, to education, to civic engagement. And for health, in addition to the healthy homes element of green building, housing and public health practitioners recognize that housing quality, housing location, and housing affordability are fundamental indicators of the social determinants of health. So there's incredible alignment. A quick snapshot of the affordable housing sector in the United States. Uh, For new construction today, the biggest source of funding is through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, or LIHTC, and that generates about 80,000 units a year. Those are mostly multifamily, mostly rental housing. They fit into the total annual housing production, uh, which is about 849,000 units of single family housing and about 354,000 units of multifamily housing. The multifamily is a mix of condo and rental units. So you can see that the affordable housing component of the total annual production is about 20% of the multifamily units and is an even higher share if we consider only the rental housing units. We also have to think about the existing housing stock. There are at least 5 million units of existing affordable housing, about a 50-50 split between public and other forms of federally subsidized housing units, and 2.5 million units that have been built with the LIHTC program since its beginning a number of years ago. Now, USGBC has had a strong history of engagement with affordable housing. Previously, uh, in terms of governance, there was a board seat for the affordable housing industry. Uh, That was an initiative of Gail Vittori when she was president of the board. But then the board got restructured, and as far as I'm able to tell, currently no board member is a representative of the affordable housing and community development industry, and I don't see anyone with that experience on the lead steering committee either. And in the past, uh, for a number of years, USGBC had an affordable housing fellow, and that person played a really important role in both uh, being a liaison and being a communication channel. That was internal and external, so they worked within USGBC across the rating systems and programs they were being developed to make sure that affordable housing was at least being uh, considered internally. And they were also an important connector to affordable housing developers and to the organizations and uh, policy advocacy network for affordable housing. And in its programs, they previously sought out funding that enabled them to provide technical assistance and some grants and to have an industry presence in the affordable housing world. And that 
paid off uh, when in this is from a 2015 uh, US GBC policy brief uh, and affordable housing represented 43% of the lead for home certified projects in 2014. And you remember that affordable housing is about 20% of the uh, typical new construction start. So you can see that affordable housing is punching above its weight in terms of its participation in the LEAD programs. So the challenge for USGBC is that there is this terrific alignment between the goals of the affordable housing sector and the goals that USGBC has set for itself with the four pillars. It's looking for equitable share of green building benefits coming to the vulnerable and the underserved and increasing the health, the resilience, and the sustainability of housing and of communities. But the challenge is that affordable housing is its own sector within the real estate industry. It has its own people, its own designers, its own contractors, its own sources of funding. It has a, a different set of professional associations, advocacy organizations, and its own communication channel. And those are not the same as the, the usual market-focused communication channels and uh, organizational channels that USGBC is used to reaching. And the typical methods will not work well to, to reach and truly partner with the affordable housing sector. So it requires a specific long-term focus and commitment from USGBC at all levels. And so to think again about governance and the organizational leadership and to make sure that there is consistent representation from the affordable housing and community development sector, whether that's on the board, whether that's on the lead advisory committee, or whether that is on the other standing committees throughout USDC. And in staffing, I, I call for having, again, a dedicated staff person with sector expertise to provide that vital role of being the voice for affordable housing within the US GBC world and community and also being that external link to both the practitioners who are building affordable housing and to uh, the larger industry. And then once again, to think about the reading systems programs and outreach and make sure that they're being targeted to the needs of the affordable housing interest industry so that the education and awareness activities that USGBC does uh, so that there is the ability to provide especially technical assistance and program support but also possibly grant support and for USGBC not necessarily to take the lead, but to be an active stakeholder and member of the ongoing policy conversation around affordable housing, sustainability, and equity. If GBC commits to that, it's, it's a big step, I understand, but it will reinforce the four pillars that they have set out for themselves, and by supporting affordable housing will advance equity as well as sustainability, resilience, and health in affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. And thanks for starting us off for really looking at uh, governance, governance and uh, where USTBC has been and could be going. Um, I have a question for you and, and maybe George, and then we'll take any that come up on the chat. Um, do you think this approach is specific to affordable housing or should it be considered for the other equity issues as well, things like um, environmental justice, access, health and well-being, jobs. Uh, I I am an advocate and an, a practitioner in the affordable housing space, so I'm making the case for my space. But it occurred to me that other people throughout the next two days would be saying, we need to be at the table too. We need to be in the governance structure. And so I think to USGBC, uh, it may not be that every voice is at the table at every table. But I think it's important to avoid uh, tokenism. So there can't just be one seat at the table representing all of these different threads. There's got to be two or three seats at all tables that are bringing the, this range of perspectives 
into the entire process of the organization and its programs. Hey, Kimberly, this is George. One of the things you mentioned is, um, for lack of a better description, it's almost like it's two separate sandboxes, that uh, the group that kind of meets and makes decisions, and does that evolve and are the trends changing? So what I'm asking is, to be disruptive, would we need to be at the place where we try to work with that group to understand where the puck is going, or should we just join at the place where they're currently working as they begin to level set these strategies for affordable housing in the future? Because I think that after we come back, things won't be the same, and, and there'll be an opportunity to look to level set and reset the expectations for affordable housing, what that looks like and feels like in terms of what COVID has placed out there. Just wanted your feedback on that. Sure. If if you mean in terms of the larger affordable housing uh, sector and the, um, the folks who are uh, interested in resilience and sustainability and health in that sector, I don't feel like USDBC needs to lead the way. There's a lot of good thinking going on there, but it would be to everyone's advantage, uh, USGBC and the industry, to have USGBC joining in those conversations, joining in the rethinking of what is possible, joining in the policy and advocacy dialogue. Should we open it up for questions from the group? I'm trying to scroll and yeah one one thing that seems to have come up is how do you start connecting with people who are doing this work and i'm thinking new as well as existing affordable housing it's not as you say kimberly something that usgbc has done previously in a great way in a large way um how do we start making those connections uh again this goes back to staffing and having someone who has their job description making those connections uh, uh, there, there's really three large national organizations that support the affordable housing industry broadly. That's NeighborWorks America, it's Enterprise Community Partners, and it's LIF, the Local Initiative Support Corporation. Uh, two out of the three of those organizations are in the D.C. area, and LISC is out of New York but has a presence in D.C. as well. And then the larger, the larger affordable housing advocacy organizations are all DC-based. Uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, and, and a number of, of others. So the people are there, and they're eager to connect with USGBC. But there has not, since the affordable housing fellow position uh, was not refilled after the last person left, there hasn't been. Uh, a person and a place within USGBC for those connections to be made. Certainly that sounds like something that is doable. There's enough interest out there and people doing it that um, could be put in place. Um, I think right, I, yeah, I, just say, I got a note from Heather saying we'll do some more questions at the end. And uh, we're going to be pulling together. I think someone is gathering questions for us as well. Great. So we're going to move forward with the next presentation. And we do have poll, a poll question up there. If everyone we can uh, respond to it in the chat. Come back to you at the end with the response. Next, we have assessing the current state, and that's going to be Richard Gelb and Nori Katabe. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Nori Katabe. Um, uh, I'm the program manager for the County Screen Building Team, and partnering with Richard Gelb today. Um, from Martin Luther King Jr. County um, in the greater Seattle area. Um, so thank you very much to the USGBC for including us um, in this um, great event and summit. Really looking forward to um, hearing all the presentations. Um, so part of our um, uh, panel discussion today um, topic is um, assessing current state um, uh, to inform pro-equity project development. Uh, and so this is sort of um, our way of uh, setting the foundation for all of our projects. Um, Richard and I were part of our county green building team that um, developed uh, efforts related to equity and social justice on capital projects. So we're just going to share a little bit about um, some tools and processes uh, that we're trying to apply to our individual capital projects. 
So if you think about it, um, delivering projects that have a positive impact on various users, uh, neighbors, employees, uh, visitors, and residents um, in every project school, um, that's a, what we want to do. Um, but sometimes it's not um, as simple or as easy as one would say. But um, as all of us are doing here today, um, we're coming to the challenge, we're, we're coming to the table and, and meeting um, those, those issues. Um, so equitable engagement and participation will inform project approaches um, that are driven by community perspectives um, while mapping and highlighting disparities and local needs that can be addressed by projects, um, by a project strategy. Um, moving the needle um, toward pro-equity projects is both about process and outcomes and how and what um, we develop. Um, so process equity um, is about power sharing um, and inclusivity um, in planning, design, and implementation. So we're looking at changing the governance of um, our projects in, um, individually. So Richard's going to go through some slides um, about our processes and, and foundational tools. Um, and I'll finish up on a project example. Hi, hi all. Uh, Richard Gelb here. I have had the privilege of working with Nori Katabe for, for many years on, on green building and sustainable development. And uh, we um, have some experience under our belt here in King County. Uh, we've had an a ordinance in place around equity and social justice since 2010 that guides our work. Um, I want to start off with some assumptions to kind of set the stage. One is that um, we're all implicated in this as uh, we all live in communities with uh, some form of structural inequities. And um, therefore, everyone involved in development has some uh, role in addressing this imperative. And uh, the character of inequities are unique to various communities. So uh, understanding how inequities are playing out locally is um, part of the current state assessment. Um, and assuming that one is uh, completely familiar with those is, is probably um, problematic for being able to be influenced by community. The initial size up um, is relevant at multiple scales, whether your project is a site-based, parcel-based uh, building, or we're talking about a neighborhood or a citywide in um, intervention or programmatic uh, a policy or a programmatic change. All of these can be informed by initial size up um, and how that's done is, is critically important. So, um, you know, our experience uh, indicates to us that that the who, when, how, and uh, what is invited is, is critical to that current state in, in terms of um, setting up a collaborative atmosphere where the perspective and priorities of folks who are affected by the project, especially those who are or historically been at the margins, is um, part of what is required to uh, be pro-equity in a way that's, that's context sensitive. The equity impact review is a, um, a tool that we've been using for many years in King County. It's kind of a way to, um, to formally understand how uh, conditions vary across the landscape. Um, and our equity impact review seeks to provide insights into these three major dimensions of equity and social justice as we've defined them in King County. And several of people have spoken already to this notion of process equity, about um, the decision and governance process being inclusive, that um, we're designing our engagement process for the margins, and um, that we have figured out how to not only have uh, more than mainstream voices at the table, but we're preparing the project team to receive that guidance and input and have room to be influenced. And um, one of the findings of late uh, is that just being able to listen is insufficient. It's also about the ability to take that input and, and, and have it um, change the course of, of a project. 
And so we're increasingly trying to get this posture of, of co-design, co-development. Co uh, distributional equity is, is simply about, in a point of time, how are the good stuff, uh, amenities, um, community resources um, going to be affected in their distribution? Or this is also about a big piece of environmental justice where additional uh, burdens are piled up on some communities and, um, and, prevent, and, and, and prevent access to healthy uh, opportunities for all. Cross-generational equity is kind of um, the historic uh, respect for past generations, considering what will be passed to those who have yet to come in terms of their access to a uh, fair share of resources, not inheriting disadvantages. Um, so these dimensions are all part of an initial uh, uh, current state assessment in terms of how the process equity is being set up. Um, what is the, the context in terms of the distribution of good stuff and bad stuff and the proximity of the uh, project uh, zone, the scope of the project, and then considering cross-generational um, effects. And um, in terms of stepping into process equity, um, understanding um, the context is critical. Uh, we have in, in King County basically, you know, trying to um, um, bring stereoscopic vision. So we are bringing in the qualitative perspectives through the listening process and bringing quantitative perspectives, um, empirical understanding of inequities through maps and other tools that um, in part were provided to us through the uh, STAR Communities Program prior to it being um, part of the lead for communities and cities. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, equity impact review is just the systematic way of uh, gathering information about equity considerations. Um, our experience is that all project team members come in with their own biases and preconceptions and unspoken assumptions about inequities. Um, and uh, this process helps us get all the varying perspectives on the table and be systematic about how we're going to use our understanding of inequities to guide planning and decision making at whatever scale. Uh, and so this is an iterative process. I think the next slide kind of shows this as um, something that's ongoing. This review process, as Nori is going to describe, you, um, our teams may go through several iterations of this equity impact review during a project that has multiple phases. In the middle there is some very important words to us. Um, on the top it says guided by community priorities. This is the qualitative um, assessment part where listening and understanding the affected communities is um, uh, a qualitative step. And then underneath that, uh, we're informed by current equity conditions. This is mostly the quantitative understanding of the backdrop of, of the project. And um, I think the next slide shows us some of the um, elements of process equity where we're trying to engage with community in a way that represents the room we have to be influenced. And um, there are times when our engagement is mostly in form and um, as we move toward co-design, co-development, we're clearly moving to the right in these levels of community gate engagement toward uh, working together or having community have a strong influence and or a lead role in how we proceed. Uh, just um, a note here about how to design for the margin in settings like King County, where we have a large percent of our population that are speaking languages other than English in their homes. And if we have a project in, in geographies of our county where uh, linguistically isolated households may be um, more than half of the residents in a particular geography, 
uh, then resourcing for interacting with residents who are speaking languages other than English is something that the project team needs to um, garner resources for from the beginning. So this is just a, one of the ways we would understand empirically what the backdrop is and use that to uh, tool up and calibrate the resources we need to have that qualitative understanding in the listening process. Uh, this is just illustrating um, the initial point about structural inequities and how they play out in, in our county. Um, this is looking at the western side of King County. We have 39 cities, in, mostly in the geography you're seeing in these three panels. And uh, we just have a, a visual um, depiction of the relationship between people of color concentrations, where the highest are in purple in the left panel, and geographies that are mostly white are um, the lowest percent people of color and shown in orange here. And that correlates very closely to the middle panel around the geographies where low income residents are concentrated and where we have uh, low life expectancy. So these are just some of the empirical basis. Um, this map shows how we um, look at our priority populations and integrate demographic characteristics to create our geographies of concern where we would have additional resources to advance equity in geographies that are in these maroon areas where on this map we have resident populations that have a confluence of factors that um, uh, may make it more difficult for us to reach them. We might have to work through community-based organizations and we might have additional challenges to address concerns that are unique to these areas that have um, been left out of access to resources historically. This is all part of um, how we might approach an equity impact review. The green lines on this slide are the uh, network of our regional trail network. This is an example of an equity impact review to look at the quantitative distribution of a resource vis-a-vis -vis the backdrop of the demographics. And you can see here um, what we've done is look at um, who's proximal to the regional trail network and where do we have areas that are left out of this resource. And uh, the next slide shows an analysis, I'm sorry, we, we missed the one about um, how new projects are identified in, um, on using this map to say, if we're gonna build new trail segments that we wanna serve, uh, we want to make proximal to those whose needs are greatest, how can we compare different project alternatives and find the ones that are gonna be pro-equity? that are going to land in the geographies where needs are greatest. So that's just an overview of, of how equity impact review uh, uses um, quantitative information or empirical information and marries that up with qualitative information. Um, I'm gonna just close out with uh, the topic of, of how we know if something is pro-equity. Um, we're considering that uh, to in, have a process that has inclusive power dynamics where decision and project, uh, the process and the project goals involves uh, an array of perspectives, those that are typically involved and those that might be more to the margins, um, that we are dealing and in, 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 um, advancing a distributional equity pattern that resolves for inequities that exist in the, in the context in which we're working and then we're leaning on this concept of targeted universalism, which uh, is, um, has been developed by the Haas Institute at, U at UC Berkeley, and it really gives us the ability to point resources to where the needs are greatest, to define our intended universal outcomes and the current level of variability, identify obstacles faced by those who are below a determined floor, and then um, advanced strategies that lift up the conditions for those whose needs are greatest. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nori, who will um, go into our tools and examples. 
Um, so this is a snapshot of um, the, the tools and practices that we um, ask our projects to employ. Um, we're going to focus in on the first four um, on the left, um, uh, developing an ESJ plan, participation, um, partnership engagement, um, diverse uh, project design teams, and what um, Richard was talking about in terms of conducting an equity impact review. Um, I'll speak about the other credits um, tomorrow, um, but for today, we're just focusing on these. Um, so this is an example from our South County Recycling and Transfer Station um, and our equity impact review for that project. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but then in the lower um, left hand um, uh, part of the map where it's shaded in, in beige, uh, that's the location and the service area for the transfer station. And um, uh, what we also assessed is the access in terms of recycling services for our community. What we had found was there was a lack of recycling services in that area. And so some would question, well, why would you um, site a transfer station in South County where, if you remember the maps that um, Richard was showing, um, a lot of our um, communities of color were living in our South King County area. But um, the discrepancy here was um, they weren't having access to recycling services. And what does that mean for people? Um, a reduction in cost for services that they should have access to as public um, residents in our community. So. Um, having that facility here was both a service equity issue, so foundationally um, and uh, providing equitable service to our public, but then also looking at um, how does that actually specific apply to the project. And so another part of the equity impact review is looking at the siting of the location and the impacts of the community. So this is a snapshot of a transportation um, study for the area, the site in B, which is in the red area, has the most negative impacts in the community, and the site in yellow, or site A, has less impacts to the community. So along with transportation data, uh, noise data, um, odor data, um, we looked at um, what are the factors to our community. So these are um, two maps of wind. Um, so wind impacts odor. Um, trans order um, transmission. And so how does that impact our community? So the, the um, property on the right was the property in the red area. The property on the left was the property in the left area. You can see the, the more negative impact was um, on in the red area. So factoring in um, having that information as part of our community assessment and project assessment is really important. Um, and looking at how that impacts um, the broader community, not just providing the service. And so um, these are just some elements in terms of um, talking about the current state, the composition of your team, how does that affect, how does that represent the community that you're working and developing in, uh, the context of the project, um, who will benefit, um, who has the burden of the project, um, and the, the development that you are creating and the asset that you're building in the community. And then community priorities, as um, Richard mentioned, you know, how are we engaging um, full representation of the communities that live and work and um, play around the asset that we're trying to, um, to develop? Um, how are their concerns being met? How are they addressed? How are they represented in the community um, and in the project? And then lastly, um, the potential contributions, um, both positive and, and negative. Um, how does that factor in in all of the information um, that we are using to develop um, decisions on the project that um, for public projects, these are going to be assets in our community that will be there for decades. And it's really, really important to ensure that our, our community members, um, people who live in the area are represented um, during development. And so with all of this, um, we look at this in an iterative process. So it's not just like look at the data once and leave it on the shelf. We need to continue to look at it, continue to collaborate, continue to talk, and continue to correct ourselves. If we need to make an adjustment, um, allow the time and the schedule to do so. 
um, allow the time and inclusivity of our community so that they can impact on um, this sort of circle of development. Um, um, it's not just um, a one shot and done. Um, we have to continue to talk about it. And how we refer to this is, you know, um, on lead projects. You don't look at your lead checklist once and know what you're going to do. Um, you have to look at it constantly. It's an iterative process and it has to be part of the conversation all throughout the project. Um, so this is um, a quick snapshot. Um, I know, I think we went a little bit over time, but um, um, please feel free to ask us any questions and looking forward to the discussion after the panel. Thank you, Nori and Richard. Great job. Very uh, good detailed information, which is one of the things that people have been asking for and thank you for the support that you've given in your work. I can tell you guys are tremendously committed to and passionate about uh, the work that you're doing. So thank you for that. All right, who's up next? Uh, a quick question, if I could, real fast. Uh, Nori, and please excuse my pronunciation of your last name. Um, the mapping is wonderful. It feels like you really get a chance to see what's going on. Can you, um, can you do this for all projects? Can you require any project in Kings County to do this? Yes. Um, uh, depending on the scale of the projects, we're requiring this um, for all projects, um, um, particularly if they're large in scale, like um, the one that we gave. Um, if they're smaller in scale, maybe that assessment is um, um, scaled to the project resources. So it might be reutilizing assessments from previous projects. So um, a retrofit that's just a floor of a building um, would not, you know, entail a full scale equity impact review as that full new construction project. But, you know, that project um, that's just a floor can use a snapshot of um, a, an assessment from a previous project. Thank you. That was great. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my Hello. name is I'm Kendra. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator uh, for the Office of Sustainability in the City of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and we, at the beginning of this year, started our engagement process for our RVA Green 2050 um, Climate Action Plan. And we've had to make quite a few changes um, in how we are engaging our community, and it really gave us the opportunity to look into um, some things that we could adjust for improvement and just sort of like ways that we can engage our community in a way that really creates an outcome that's more relevant to their needs and desires uh, and sort of opens up that space. Um, so we are working on our VA Green 2050, which is our equity centered integrated climate action and resilience initiative to reduce community greenhouse gas emissions and help the community adapt to Richmond's climate impact. So what we're looking at is increased cases of extreme heat, extreme precipitation, and future impacts of sea level rise. And so we have this community-wide initiative to develop and implement a roadmap of actions that are, we're using um, an innovative planning approach that centers our frontline community members and work at the intersection of equity, mitigation, and climate resilience. So how we're defining our frontline community members, um, those are going to be particularly communities of color. Um, we have, which is mostly going to be black and brown communities and then communities experiencing poverty. And so what we know is that our frontline communities will be impacted more by climate change. And this is due to historical racism and underinvestment. Um, and more often than not, these are the very people missing from the conversation when it comes to planning processes. So, how did we identify who are our frontline community members? So we have a climate equity index map. And so you can see um, there's a variety of factors that are overlaid in this map. And that includes things like climate impact, social factors, and built as assets to help us identify where our community members are most at risk from climate change. So looking at this map, the darker the red, the less resilient. Um, the community is the climate change and the more intentionally we're going to focus our outreach and engagement during the planning process. In the darker red areas, we tend to have higher populations of black, brown, and low-income residents. So, I mean, a lot of my pictures haven't shown up, but 
none of them were particularly important. Um, it was a visual <laughs> to aid in the like aesthetic of the, the slide. Um, but when we're looking at some of the things that our low income populations and our communities of color experience, they're more likely to have um, uh, a lack of public green space, um, which is increasing their risk to urban heat islands and heat problems. Um, they have less energy efficient housing and community buildings, increased risk to extreme weather due to poor infrastructure, less access to public and active transportation, um, less air conditioning units or um, central AC, which is another factor that increases urban heat island risk. And they tend to have higher rates of asthma and other respiratory illnesses um, because of increased air pollution. So a lot of these factors are things that we're considering in the process of identifying who we uh, will be trying to work with. And part of the reason is that we're really focused on centering equity in this entire process. So by centering equity, we can address the disproportionate impact so that all members of the community are adequately prepared for the impacts of climate change and are also empowered to do and interested in doing their part to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Richmond. Uh, we are embracing procedural equity in our beginning part of the planning process. Uh, we are improving our communication tactics. We, we are trying and uh, in the process of providing information in a manner that encourages interest and participation from all communities in Richmond. Um, and through our procedural process, it will lead to distributional equity. Um, so equitable communication uh, includes why frontline communities deserve more engagement and investment and a lot of the history on racism in Richmond. And so just kind of informing all, all communities within the city why we're doing this in the process that we're doing it. So we're going to provide education on the historical and present traumas and let that underinvestment guide our intentional interaction with frontline communities. And so by creating this transparent, fair, and inclusive communication, process, we are potentially able to increase civic engagement in all neighborhoods as well as improve our own planning. So that leads us to what does climate action planning look like when we spin through the priorities of frontline uh, As I stated before, we're in the first part of this process. Uh, we are currently talking with community-based organizations and residents to understand where their priorities are and how we can use those, that sort of structure to structure our next phase of engagement where we are going to reach out to more residents. And one of the things that we've learned from our outreach currently is that culturally relevant messaging is vital to an inclusive planning process. And it's something that the city of Richmond can improve and something that we can improve in the Office of Sustainability. So we're focused on developing relevant messaging to help identify where climate resilience overlaps with resident priorities. And we've had many people acknowledge that there's not a lack of interest in climate resilience so much as that historically, um, many communities have not had their priorities centered in the planning or communication process. And so just identifying where their priorities lie and then putting the work on us to sort of make that translation. Um, so, to prioritize our resources for the frontline communities, we need to understand their lived experiences and place resources where needed and in a manner that is most beneficial to the people who are already living in that space. So our communication strategy is very much centered through a people-centered approach. Um, the topics that we are using to center climate resilience around are gonna be a lot of the concerns that have been uh, mentioned in our current um, outreach conversations, so things like affordable housing, transportation, employment, education, health, um, et cetera. Our process um, that we're using was identified through a local community organization, GA Community Voice, and their focus is on elevating the voices of community members and letting them be in, like, in making sure that the government and organizations include the community members in their process of planning and implementation. Um, we want to ensure that when strategies like green buildings are brought into communities, residents understand and want the benefits of the development and associated policies. And it's not just something being forced on them or just something that they are against because they don't, it hasn't been quite um, related to their lived experience. So we are seeking to offer resilient development in a manner that meets community needs and goals. And this process allows residents the space to assess community 
community vulnerabilities and communicate their priorities for governmental investment. And we are also working through targeted universalism. Um, so this opportunity structures respond with necessary resources and multiple tasks needed for different communities and individuals to thrive. So for our case, um, we're going to increase communication that focuses on emotional, social, and cultural values to increase understanding of climate change and climate resilience and how that's going to impact every Richmonder. Um, and one of the examples that we've had is a lot of the outreach that we ha have had with some of our community organizations has mentioned a lot of the miscommunication around COVID-19 within the city. And a lot of that was because material didn't necessarily connect to resident behavior or the media was not timed appropriately or translated for all communities. So we, we know that the communication tactic works for some of our Richmond residents, but not all of our Richmond residents. So we want to learn from and improve the previous community outreach messaging by placing the burden of translation and presentation on us instead of on the communities that we're trying to engage. Uh, but basically what this all boils down to is that communi communicating equitably requires a diversified approach and one size does not fit all. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, really good work. Um, kudos to you and your team for the type of work that you're putting in in Richmond. Um, thank you so much. I, I'm I'm kind of still trying to go back to a few of the points that you've made. I was my pen was smoking over here, so I appreciate your work and your commitment. We're going to get to some questions a little bit later. Uh, unless Susan, you have one that we is burning. Kendra, do you feel like we could do this on every lead project? Yes, um, I think that a lot of what we're learning is that just sort of making the um, a lot of the media, even if it's just visual media, more representative of what people are experiencing or like the things that they want to see in their neighborhood really makes it a lot easier for them to make that direct connection to how these things will benefit. Um, some of their priorities uh, and not necessarily creating that separate line of Climate change is not something that I'm worried about. It's not something I'm experiencing and really bringing in that connection of how climate change is currently impacting people um, and how these things will help reduce some of the risks that they'll experience or a lot of the risks that they're experiencing right now and some that they'll experience in the future. Yeah. So they can see that from personal point. Well, thank you. That was so wonderful. Strictly semantics, all right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We got them next, Susan. Okay. Uh, next, we have our fourth one, which is HKS, and we have Rand, Cell, and Sarah. Well, thank you for having me. This is Rand Ekman, and also on the panel, um, pitching in when we get to the questions um, are Giselle Santos Rivera, HKS's Director of um, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and Sarah Voinitz. Uh, Sam Zeki, who is an architect and advocate in our Atlanta office. So um, thank you for having me. This is, um, I'm totally amazed by the presentations uh, so far and am um, personally, you know, a longtime um, advocate and uh, engagement individual with the U.S. Green Building Council. I have to say this whole discussion is reinvigorating my um, my interest in uh, likely to sort of dive back in with a, a new sense of purpose. Um, so what I would like to do is to share um, some context that is happening inside of uh, a large firm. Um, it's related to a holistic strategy and a governance structure for our firm in order to create the kind of change that in many ways has been laid out in some of the previous um, previous presentations. Just to set a little bit of context, we are founded, uh, HKS was founded in 1939, so we've been around for a while, which is both a good thing, and it establishes a certain level of inertia that is a barrier to, um, to sort of moving forth in different ways. We're global. We have offices that are all over the world, which have many different contexts and many different cultures, um, and the relevancy of the work that we do is global. We're big. We have over uh, 1,200 staff, um, so we have many hearts and minds that need to be engaged and need to be brought uh, brought along um, in, a, in a holistic um, perspective. We are privately owned, um, and that's an important uh, quality to consider because there are many um, 
many programs, I think, that are being advanced quickly around the globe um, that are sort of required to do um, social equity issues or environmental social governance reporting because they are publicly traded and the financial institutions require it. We don't fall into that category. So what we're doing is really built into the um, sort of the culture and the zeitgeist of, of the firm that we're trying to become. Um, we have had a long standing and continually evolving commitment to the ability of design to build a better world. And I, uh, you know, the, the better world for all pieces um, containing um, a host of different contexts equity being one of them, sustainability being another. Um, and what I'm going to, what I think you will see as we move forward is that we've had many activities and initiatives along um, any of those sort of threads, but tying them all together into a, um, a cohesive fabric was something that we had not yet done. And that was the whole, that is the holistic strategy and the governance structure piece of it. So why did we do this and what was the importance of it? Um, you know, it was a, obviously it's a framework to address the pressing global issues that affect us globally, um, our communities locally and our business. Um, it, it was necessary um, to touch the over 1200 hearts and minds um, with a consistent and vital message. Um, we needed an authentic platform to, um, to launch ourselves from. We needed to build system literacy in a way that wasn't ours or unique. It needed to be authentic to our firm, but it didn't need to be just ours. It needed to be understood in a way that other global organizations and, and companies um, were readily able to understand. Um, and then the last two are also quite important, the um, establishment of metrics both on an organizational and project level. And I'm fascinated in some of the project detail that's being shared today. And then to uncover um, the uh, potential for um, business to business partnerships to sort of move things faster and with more scale than we would as a single organization. So what does this mean? Um, this meant for us, um, signing on to the UN Global Compact. Just quite directly, that was a, um, a commitment that we uh, wanted to make. Um, there was a team that had been pushing this with our board of directors and our president for, for quite a while. Um, the UN Global Compact carries with it a sense, uh, sort of a, a set of responsibilities. It's also a process that's built around continuous improvement. The other wonderful thing about it is that it has, like many of the programs that um, US Green Building Council and GBCI work with, um, it has a, a sort of an annual um, communication on progress that requires an internal assessment about where you're headed and how well you're doing um, in meeting the goals that you've established. So the other layer that comes with this are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, personally, I think these are um, one of the more um, inspiring and effective frameworks that's, um, that's, uh, that's I guess, hit, <coughs> hit our industry or hit our um, culture broadly, globally. Um, it's, a, it's a broad set of 17 quite important issues. Not all of them, um, I would say, well, maybe all of them do hit equity issues, but they hit it in different ways and from different perspectives. So our first question was, what does this mean? How do we engage with this? And how is it that we're going to be able to move our organization along a pathway that's, um, that's aligned with this? We went through a, an initial process um, called principled prioritization. This is um, identifying areas that the work that the organization goes, sort of does for us, an architecture and design firm, um, have the ability to sort of directly influence. Um, there are lots of debates about whether these eight are the right ones or whether we should including all of them. Um, I tend to agree with almost all of the arguments, um, but we needed a place to start. So we identified um, eight of the sustainable development goals that we would were able to sort of um, attach ourselves to quite quickly and build program around. So this translated into um, 
a set of issues that had sort of two levels to them. Well, the sustainable development goals, the eight that I just showed you are the, across the center there. Um, the project-based work, the work that we do as designers and that we do for our clients um, is the sort of bottom third of this diagram. So there were like issues of um, third-party certification, materials, um, DBE and WBE uh, requirements, um, climate 2030 commitment um, programs having to do with relate relationships that we develop with our um, with our communities, <coughs> um, life cycle assessment, net zero, regenerative design. There's a whole host of things that are embedded in the projects that we do. There's another category of um, issues that are operational. Um, and I'm calling them operational because these are enterprise related things that, that are sort of more about the way we do our work and the people and the organization that we are. So staff health and well-being, pay equity, um, corporate carbon footprint, ethical policies, um, equity and diversity policies, things about how we run our enterprise. Um, so one key thing I think that's good to recognize here is that this isn't three diagrams, this is one. Um, and that's the whole, that is one of the whole sort of premises behind the holistic strategy. So in context, this, um, this meant that we were bringing together um, a set of activities that were around the long-time environmental commitment that the firm had had. Um, the, the um, growing and also long time social commitment that the firm had and um, a rapidly developing uh, desire to understand outcomes, impact, and then have that um, structured and reported in a way that is accessible on an annual basis um, for continuous improvement purposes. So we had many of these pieces already active. What we did not have was the governance structure to pull all this together and create um, create sort of a leadership structure and a set of advocates um, and champions across the practice. We had been working with um, LEED and other certification programs for a long time. We had a whole host of environmental projects that we were delivering for our clients. We have a team that is focused on doing that kind of work and building um, business opportunities around largely sustainability. We had and have um, another team that is uh, called Citizen HKS that has been active for quite a few years um, in doing public interest design. Grew out of the 1% solution in the late 2000s and has continued to be a very active and robust part of our firm. And then we have stood up the um, Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Network led by Giselle. Um, yes, uh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, led by Giselle uh, Santos Rivera. Um, and below each of those are um, leadership teams and then champion networks that reach out into each of the, um, each of the offices and the uh, localities where we're doing the work. This is uh, a, a few quick shots, and I know that's not readable, but I wanted to just give you a taste of what, the, um, what we're in the midst of at the moment. We're um, likely to publish this uh, in the next few weeks. Um, this is, um, we're not, it, it would be our communication on progress had we, um, had we done this for a year or two, and we're actually communicating on progress right now. It's, we're calling it our touchstone report. So it is an assessment of where we are and what we need to do. And it is a connection of the, the organization that we are, the enterprise that we are globally, um, and mapping that to the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN Global Compact. Um, we've gone through a materiality assessment. Um, we've related these issues to our uh, strategic plan. We've identified stakeholders that are critical to meet um, the needs of, and then we're in the process of um, identifying assessment, uh, assessment protocol policy and, and goals for all these issues. Um, this is an example of the uh, piece of the Citizen HKS program. We do um, public interest design projects all over the globe. Um, we don't do uh, a ton of them, but the ones that we do are very, um, very, I think, are very impactful and meaningful. 
Um, you can note that the public interest design is one of those things that touches nearly every, um, every sustainable development goal as well as um, all aspects of the UN Global Compact. Um, and then we have a section in here that is uh, also around our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, programs. As I said earlier, this is, uh, this is newly stood up, um, but we are in the process of, um, of assessing our, uh, our current state and establishing these goals, um, goals as well, both from a governance perspective and from a change management perspective. Um, we've also mapped sort of the things that we are doing on, on the left hand side. It's far too small for you to read, I understand, but on the left hand side are the activities that are happening inside of the firm, either on an enterprise level or on a design and project level. Um, and then where it is that those um, enable us to contribute to our overarching objective of meeting the S sustainable development goals in the, in the UN Global Compact. Um, and then we've also sort of mapped the same thing um, related to projects. This particular, um, this particular diagram is built around the framework for design excellence that is being put forth by the AIA. Um, we feel it's relatively comprehensive and it's a very solid motivator for not just lead projects, but every project. And that's an important uh, characteristic for us. We're not trying to identify the outliers, although we have those and those are important, we really do want to, you know, be on the, on the edge with many of our projects, but more fundamentally, we need this to happen at scale across our practice in all of our offices. This is the cover of the Touchstone report. Um, look for this in the next uh, three or four weeks. Um, I'm really quite thrilled that we've been able to do this. As you might imagine, there are a whole host of issues that have to do with um, you know, have to do with transparency and have to do with governance questions about what can and should be shared publicly. <clears throat> and this is um, sort of a revealing and an unveiling, so I'm um, very encouraged that our firm is, as, uh, has, is doing this, has signed on to the UN Global Compact and has made the commitment to do that on an annual basis. That was great. Thank you. And it's really interesting to see all the presentations um, have a different perspective, starting with the organizational and then going to government and practitioners. Um, we have some questions, I think, George, unless you have a question, Bernie. Question number one to the panel. In your opinion, is there enough scientific research on the topic of social equity on the built environment? And would that contribute to the business case of sustainability for companies, government, or public? Or do we need, as an industry and advocates, other and more impactful ways to influence decision makers, maybe changing who makes the decisions. Um, so this is, oh, is oh yeah. Um, so it kind of responded in the chat. Um, so I think it would be helpful, um, but I know sometimes there's also equity in terms of who funds these studies and where the stats are being gathered and who participates. And so as that information is coming in and is prioritized and, and accomplished. Um, I think it's also important that we um, uh, value the stories that we're hearing from our community members. Um, I know um, from our community here in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of our elders um, tell us what they want, tell us um, qualitatively storytelling, um, you know, folks who comfortable, you know, participating in a study or, or whatnot, um, their voices may not be heard in that kind of um, reporting. And so valuing uh, the stories that we're hearing from our community members um, um, should have, you know, some weight as well. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, one of the things I, I agree with you, Nori, I think that uh, both the scientific and technical data are one thing, but being a keeper of the heart, we also need some qualitative data that allows us to, to bring local influence and have some significance to that. George, is the question you're asking the first question there about um, the business case for, uh, for companies, governments, and public? That's correct. Yeah, so I will offer that one of the reasons that we took the pathway that we, we did is there are over 10,000 
global companies and organizations that have signed on to the Global Compact. So it's not a small movement. It's a quite big movement. And most of those companies, many, are global and big. So they're committing to doing this, not knowing exactly what the pathway is going to lead them towards, um, ultimately. Um, and part of the structure that's built into that commitment is um, engagement and partnership conversations within that um, global compact community so that we can get better at this. So from my perspective, I think that is the business case. It is a relevant um, issue for um, global businesses. There's no doubt about it. And if it's not, if one's not participating, you're on the edge of, of uh, not being as relevant as you'd like to be. So Rand, in follow-up to that, um, based on the presentation that you made, do you feel that uh, the work that you guys have done is transferable to the AIA since you're such a strategic part of what uh, the green building is going to look like as we transfer forward uh, after COVID-19. Do you think that the information that you've provided and the strategies you've developed is something that AIA would be able to cascade at a higher level across all design firms or for um, National Organization of Minority Architects or for any other organization that has architecture as their base? Is this a transferable thing or will it become individualized, which will kind of slow us down in terms of our progress? Yeah, um, I think it is definitely um, transferable. I think uh, part of the issue that I have seen for, for years is that we, we look at our contribution to advancing these issues um, at a project level. And sometimes we look at them on, on the level of a um, sort of relatively small group of projects. And I, I don't mean to say we shouldn't be doing that because that's absolutely essential. But I think if we're going to solve the issues that we need to solve at scale, we need to um, we need to look at the organizational level. Um, that's an important an important component to this. So I don't always see um, organizations like the AIA or, quite honestly, um, you know, USGBC sort of taking the perspective of the organization and the enterprise. Um, we frequently are in, at the level of the project. And I don't want to say that's not what we should be doing, but I think we need to do both. And until we can get to the organizational level, we're going to be um, struggling. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take the next question, and this is a question that uh, came from one of our attendees. In the sustainability community, largely characterized by middle-class white participants, how do we engage underrepresented communities and establish rapport with minority coalition groups to bring them into sustainability projects tangibly? I think this um, really goes back to identifying what, uh, what interest communities have and sort of tying those interests a lot to sustainability. Um, uh, as I previously said, it's not that people aren't interested in a lot of these things. A lot of people have the same sort of uh, neighborhood goals and life goals and just like making connections between what people identify as their goals and how sustainability impacts some of those things. Um, a lot of times in my experience working with, I've worked with a lot of youth in the city of Richmond and they're all just like innately interested in being outside and enjoying the outside space and working through that. And so sort of connecting their love of the outdoors to a lot of sustainability action has really brought them into that sort of conversation and made them champions for sustainability in their life, which has spread beyond their specific group of friends to some of their family members, a lot of people in their neighborhoods. So sort of building up that um, excitement in youth is a really good way to engage people who haven't already been engaged in the process because a lot of uh, communities are embrace their their youth taking on new hobbies or habits or things like that that sort of keep them uh, engaged in school and um, out of different activities that they could be participating in. So there's been a lot of, of support from different communities on having their youth engage in this process and then learning from that experience as well. I, I will follow up um, on Kendra's comments to say, you know, I, I think that one of the experiences that I've had in, in this work over an extended period of time is there is no one who doesn't want um, good water to drink, good air, communities with 
good parks and playgrounds, civil services that provide them um, communities with grocery stores and uh, organic opportunities for gardens and those types of things. Uh, I think that sometimes there may be other priorities that are in front of those things that uh, you might be viewing as, hey, that just has to occur, uh, that prohibit people from seeing that this would solve some of the other internal issues. And it's a, a semantic conversation that needs to happen uh, at both the local level. I feel like all sustainability is local. So uh, there's a there can be a congregation of communication at a higher level, but I feel like we need to engage uh, with hearing some of the local uh, perspectives that all boil up and being able to communicate in a way that allows people to see that the fact that you have kids in elementary school who can't go outside is a global warming issue. They look at it as an asthma issue. <laughs> and uh, relating those things in a different way and allowing us to be able to communicate them effectively is going to be critically important to the success of this opportunity that we have in front of us. I'd, I'd like to, this is Giselle. Um, George, I'm, I completely agree. I think there's a, a level of education that I think firms and organizations need to own in, in imparting this, you know, what sustainability really means to underserved and underprivileged communities. And I think, I think something we don't do enough that, that is kind of simple is we just have to ask. I think we have to embed ourselves in the, in the communities and ask them and pull them into the conversation instead of expecting them to understand what we're talking about and understand what it means to be truly sustainable and what it means for, for their livelihood and for, for their children. Um, I think education is key and, and really embedding ourselves in there and being advocates for them in the overall conversation. I agree, Giselle. Thank you so much. Susan, are you speaking? <laughs> okay. I, I caught you in a moment. <laughs> I was just looking back at the questions, and, and I'm interested in that last one. Um, I was trying to scroll. Uh, about... Um, how you bring people in and is is it important to um, be able to to give compensation for participation? Is there um, specific training that everybody should have? Um, is, is it a different approach that's more flexible to be able to do good engagement? Susan, I would say that it's all of those things. I, I'll yeah. first. Um, I think that it's not just engaging uh, organizations that are focused on specific things related to social equity. It's influencing the organizations that we're currently in to recognize that it's important for those larger organizations to uh, have an interest in that as well. I think it's not just a cascading down, but it's also a uh, how do you impact the people who you currently exist and uh, work with and try to have a voice around thinking of things a little bit differently. Um, one of the things that I used to always uh, get frustrated about was early on when I first started attending Green Build, every presenter would start with a historically Native American or some other gender quote around the environment and its importance and its seven generations. And then they would go off into specific things that were related to um, identifying their business as the one that would actually do all of that stuff. And I, I would always sit there and say, well, if they had it right 150 years ago, they probably still got it right. But um, one of the things that I feel like we have to do is that you have to influence where you are. And I think that having something like this, I think the work that Kimberly and Ryan and Mahesh and uh, Joel and you have done by bringing this to the forefront and being able to kind of have this type of conversation I'd challenge people to not just reflect outward, but reflect inward in a way and be able to address the organizations that you're currently affiliated with to kind of begin to look at this as something that's significantly important, especially in the areas that you serve and the capacities that you work in. And I think that that brings awareness to all of us in a different way because there's things that I've learned just by reading through some of the comments in the comment section that I had no idea are actually going on. but learning about them has allowed me to kind of think about things a little bit more holistically. And I think that there's an opportunity to be great here. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, you know, if you look at our poll, it says we asked about bringing lead to um, your projects. It said 81% people said yes, which of course we're a little self-selecting at this summit, but it's great to hear that people think they, that many people feel like they can yeah. do it. And I, I think one of the important things today that will, and tomorrow that we'll have to look at is how, you know, and what can USGBC do in terms of tools and training and just making it part of everything they do to make that more possible. I know Kimberly's probably on the call. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I have four millennials in my house. Lord help me. <laughs> <laughs> often, often my kids call me a perennial. They say I keep growing up another year and reinventing myself. So uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in is like, as USGBC moves forward organizationally, I think it's critical that this becomes one of the key components that allow allows the body of the USGBC, the family, as Kimberly can say, the reunion of people that are embodied in USGBC to see this. Because I don't think, this is George Bandy speaking for George Bandy, I don't think things are going to go back to the way that they were. I think there's going to be a different <laughs> world than we've seen before uh, moving forward. And I think that this will be one of the things that um, will be important as, as people move forward. I think the humility of connecting people through this pandemic has brought about a change in the way people view things, even though there's been some exposure of some things that we knew were existing that have become more transparent. At the same time, it's kind of humbled us to know that we breathe the same air, we can catch the same cold, we can be affected by the same disease, and uh, it will impact our families in a different way. So I think that there are some values that have been demonstrated in a different way that will become more important as you begin to build these new environments uh, moving forward. So I'm, I'm excited about what can be. And with that, I think we'll end it. Thank you, everyone, all the presenters and all the comments coming in. Um, and uh, we'll get a little time for, for a break and then come back at uh, 1230. Thank you so much, Susan and George and all of our panel for kicking off our conversation on governance structures.